They are the ultimate toys for grown-up boys. It's purpose designed just to have fun. Built to appeal to the rebel in all of us. It is a very, very special sensation of courting death. It's as simple as that. Most cars are made for getting where you're going. Sports cars are about the thrill of the journey. It's outrageous, it's passionate, it's emotional. Can I say it's better than sex? Through the years, there have been some gems, but which one deserves the title, Greatest Ever? To help us narrow it down to 10, we asked the world's top drivers, collectors, critics and enthusiasts what they thought. Our experts looked at performance and pedigree, style and technical innovation, and along the way, showed us what makes a truly great car. Britain's favourite aristocrat will put the James Bond car through its paces. Actor Steve McQueen's son Chad takes his famous father's wheels out for a curtain call and we'll find out why he's using simple garage tools to explain some revolutionary technology. We're also going to try and get Ferrari's latest supercar to triple the speed limit on a Louisiana interstate. So brace yourself for a red-hot ride as we count down the greatest ever sports cars. We begin our greatest ever countdown at number 10 with a car whose name literally says it all. The legend has it that when the designer first brought it out to the factory with one of the workers, he said, it's a Countach, which means, wow, my God, incredible. The Lamborghini Countach was an outrageously, deliberately provocative, sexy car. You looked at it and went, wow. I mean, it was quite uh, jaw-dropping. A Countach is you know, every teenage boy's wet dream of a sports car. The Countach qualifies for our list because it broke new ground for sports cars. It looked like nothing else that had ever come before it. It was a very dramatic car. I mean, it was angular and it was all sort of carved out of a piece of rock and then put on the road and low down. And it was supposed to stop you short and say, that's different, which it was. The reason it looked the way it did was the Formula One technology that made its way into the car. Pirelli designed the tires for the car uh, that were extremely wide. I mean, they're, they're one of the largest uh, tires that were ever put on a production car. In fact, that's the secret to this car. Because the tires were almost double the normal size, the body had to be built around them, helping to give the Countach its outrageous shape. The Space Age doors were real head turners, but they're more about styling than engineering. The car's chassis was extremely rigid, and that meant the body didn't bend or flex much in the corners. With no need to compensate for a flexing body, the suspension could be set up very tightly, just like a race car, keeping the Countach level through turns at high speed. It's designed uh, for ultimate performance in mind. Only three were produced each week, which meant the waiting list to get one was a year, it also came with a price tag of $150,000, inspiring the phrase supercar. Supercars is a name given to a car that goes above a certain speed, i.e. sort of somewhere um, between here and Mars, and will go faster than anyone needs to go. Um, so we're talking 150 plus, certainly in the mid-70s. But the Countach was more than just the fastest sports car of its day. Just like Farrah Fawcett, it was also a pinup, one that ended up in teenage boys' bedrooms all over the world. Uh, including mine. I just dreamed of having one. Eventually, after a two-year search, I found one in Alberta, Canada. And I found out, fortuitously, that this particular car was the actual car that was in uh, the poster that I had as a kid. It was from that period in the 70s where the big hairstyles were in, the, um, the padded shoulders, girls looking sort of big and brazen in Hollywood, and the car looks a bit like that. It's Italian, it's kind of, but it's busty, sexy, glamorous. To drive, I would have to say it was thrilling but not relaxing. It was 
not a great long distance car. The noise level was very intense. There's one of those cars that you could say one of the best moments of your life is the first hour you drive Countach, and but the second hour is one of the worst experiences of your life. Because you've got no rear vision. You can't see what you're doing most of the time. Bad visibility while driving forward was one problem, but with a tiny rear window, reversing was even trickier. You know, the Lamborghini factory taught people how to back the car up, and you actually have to put the door up crawl out and sit on the sill with one foot on the gas and one hand on the wheel, and then look over your shoulder. So you had to hang out of the car to drive it. It's silly, but uh, for the 15-year-old for the boy in you, it's absolutely fantastic. But what seems fun to a teenage boy was definitely not for everyone's tastes. It's a car, you know, you take from your house around and then come back to your house and it wasn't meant to be reversed. Like many things that got our attention in the 70s and 80s, the Countach doesn't necessarily stand the test of time. For a lot of people, this car is downright ugly. It was, it was a cross between Star Trek and something you're, the hairdresser would really want to travel around in. So when you look in a Countach, if you can get lower down, on the, or learn up down the road and actually look in the window, you expect to see someone with a big gold chain around their neck and, you know, a few hairs poking out and a shiny shirt, uh, looking frightfully pleased with himself. It's a car that's meant to be aggressive, but it's a kind of BG on wheels. You always imagine the person that drove it looked like Robin or Barry Gibb and had big bouffant hair of the time and a medallion down here and big flared trousers. That's what it was like. It's flamboyant, it's baroque, it's a combination of Liberace and Hugh Hefner. It sums up the 80s and 70s. It's just gross, I'm sorry. Yes, it was one of the first supercars. It turned heads wherever it went, and just looking at it helps revive the 80s. But looking at it, ultimately, is the problem with the Countach. That's why it goes no higher up the list than number 10. Coming up, nine more amazing machines, including the fastest road car in the world, as our search continues for the greatest ever sports car. In our quest for the greatest ever sports cars, the Lamborghini Countach claimed the number 10 spot with its mixture of F1 technology and outrageous Italian design. At number nine, a car so fast, so intimidating, it wasn't allowed on the streets of North America. Skyline for me is a, is a dream car. It's like the heartbeat of Japan. You know, it's the Ferrari of the Orient. The youth market today can look at it and go, that's my dream car. It's been described as a PlayStation on wheels. Normal cars tell their drivers about oil temperature and battery power, the Nissan Skyline has its own computer system that tracks and controls everything from G-force to turbo boost to the amount of torque to the front wheels. This car has an engine management system that controls all of the sensors, the injectors, everything. Bang from US roads, the Skyline has become a much better match for the racetrack in North America. The few that are imported usually end up in competitions like this one. It's called drifting. Drifting is uh, basically all about car control. It's sliding the car sideways on a marked course. The Skyline is a good drift car because of its ability to channel enormous power to the rear wheels. The true secret behind the success and popularity of this car is that it can be hacked into or tuned. You can uh, change it according to the RPM. First, the car's computer system is hooked up to a laptop. Next, the factory-installed power and emissions controls are removed. In a way, it, you could consider it hacking. Without any governors, tuners can then boost horsepower and speed through a simple entry in their computer. In theory, you could do it to your own car. The difference with a Skyline is that the engine has so much capacity, it can tolerate increased horsepower without blowing up. You could get a thousand horsepower out of these engines without blowing them up. So it, it, it became the benchmark of all tuner cars. It looks very discreet. It's rather like um, a Japanese 9-to-5 businessman going home on the metro in Tokyo. It's that sort of discreet, and yet it punches this real pow! You know, it's a very powerful, very fast car. Besides all that power, the Skyline also has four-wheel steering and all-wheel drive, huge assets for controlling a sliding car. 
If your front tyres are spinning too much, the car's onboard computer transfers energy to the back. And then when they entered into the touring car series, it was just so successful, I had to put a weight handicap on it. It was just a very, very good car. And what an irritated the shit out of everybody was that it was Japanese. And now they built someone that's just looks ordinary, is ordinary, just goes better than anything else the Italians or the Brits can make. I love it. I think it's brilliant. It looked fairly benign from the outside, but it was as fast as a Ferrari and actually better behaved through the corners. Going into the first turn, this car is slow. It needs more power at the low end or low RPM to make the drift last. Hacking back into the car's computer system, Steve can effectively alter the characteristics of the engine. It doesn't have much knock, so it's way low. So I'm going to change the timing on it. Rev it. So I gave it a little bit more timing, so it'd have a little bit more power on the bottom end. Okay. At one stage, that would have required an engine rebuild. But these days, it can be done with a few keystrokes on a laptop. That was enough to give it a little more power. It felt good to her. She noticed it. I could notice it from outside, so we're still in the safe zone on the adjustments. We'll see how the next run goes. I'll tell you what, I'll take my hat off to these kids that do it with their computers and things and get these things running, sometimes as good as a Formula One car runs. The Japanese had a name for it, uh, which meant the monster. We christened it Godzilla because this car was so fast, so awesome, so powerful, and the name lived on, so Godzilla lives. Yes, Godzilla lives, but not everyone's a big fan. I have done a 20-second perfectly controlled drift in a skyline and marvelled at the technical prowess. But there's part of me that does not connect with that car. It's a big, heavy lump. Um, it's not particularly good looking. The drifting, uh, it's fun to watch, you know, I'm sure it's fun to do, but it's not my bag. That was awful. I was like, whoa! I'm like, okay, last run. I'm gonna see. And then I got around a little and it felt so good. And then right when, you know, it started feeling real good, then of course you like, your mind says, more power! And <laughs> you put more in too much, but it was good. This Nissan earned the nickname Godzilla for its power. And its use of ultra-high technology is revolutionary for sports cars. But it filled a niche that appealed only to the true techno head. Because of that, the Skyline will have to settle for number nine in our list of greatest ever sports cars. For more than 50 years, this next car has been making dreams come true for sports car lovers all over the US. In automotive terms, the Corvette Stingray is the original American Idol. I still remember pulling the car magazine out of its sleeve and looking at it and saying, oh, wow. This car was an exquisite package that came from nowhere and just slapped the hell out of the European competition. At just over 4,000 US, it was a supremely capable two-passenger sports car. Basically as competent as any sports car in the world, at a price that most people can still afford. Unlike everything else on the road, this car oozed Americana. I mean, it's got America written all over it, United States written all over it. It's a kind of stars and stripes in automobile form, really. And you can't help but seeing that car and you think everything that's big, blousy, powerful, go ahead, and a bit excessive about the United States, it's represented in that car. It's patriotic, it's blue-blooded, it's American. We will buy this in our droves because it is, it is that. And it offered what America wanted, which was fast, straight-line performance, reasonable reliability at low cost, and a thumping great V8. The earliest vets had the traditional inline six-cylinder engine. Six cylinders lined up in a row and connected to a crankshaft that turned the wheels. With a top speed of 120 miles per hour, it was a popular motor for the time. But the brass at Chevrolet wanted something with more power, something that would earn them respect. To commemorate the 50th anniversary of the V8 showing up in the Corvette, why don't we imagine that these are the cylinders? The question was how to get more cylinders under the hood without radically changing the size and shape of the engine. But how are we going to do it? Because we're tied into a package, to a size, to a weight. 
to a chassis. We're going to change everything about the car in order to fit two more straight cylinders. The answer was a simple repositioning of the cylinders. So what basically what they were able to do is create a V8 design where they had eight cylinders feeding into the crank, still down the middle, in a better package, a little bit wider, but not long. They could fit wide, they couldn't fit long. More power, same cake. Happy birthday, 50 years, V8 and a Corvette. Great engine, lots of torque, and that's the, that's the American way, because you know it is stoplight to stoplight here. There's not so many corners, it's not like Europe. Critics claim the chassis wasn't rigid enough to resist flexing at high speed. The result was that its feet, in effect, weren't as well planted on the ground. It's great on that lovely road to uh, Santa Monica, out of LA, Highway 1, you've got the Eagles playing on the 8-track, and it's fine. The slightest curve in the road, the slightest pimple or acclivity in the con contours, and you're all over the place. It's a car that's not really designed to be thrown around tight mountain bends, but it's a car for cruising along one hand on the wheel and a gorgeous girl next to you along, you know, a highway that's forever California and the coast. Now, I, I know, Uncle Sam, it, 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 it's your only sports car, but they drive them with any sort of gusto on anything but a perfectly billiard smooth road and, you know, you'll destroy a small suburb before you stop spinning. There's a crude, rough, just unrefined quality. Europeans would call me a bit crude. And, you know, they would sniff at something that came in and beat their pants off. That's what I say to them. You know, we're all a bit crude in America, but we're, we're crude but effective. How's that? Nobody can accuse the Stingray of refinement. It just doesn't have that. It's really the polar opposite of a European or Japanese sports car. It is muscle-bound, it's aggressive, it's showy, it has great fairground qualities to it. It's like a fairground ride on wheels in some ways. Um, but come on, that's, it's just such great fun. I mean, that is like, let's get out there and have fun, boys, car. And that's what it's for. If a Corvette was interviewed by a psychiatrist, the Corvette would tell the psychiatrist where to get off. It would tell the psychiatrist, psychiatrist for wimps. That's the kind of car a Corvette is. No other sports car has captured the American imagination the way the Stingray has. None has lasted so long, but critics are right to point out that it can be hard to control in the corners. That's why the Vet hits the brakes at number eight. At number seven, the car made famous by 007, the Aston Martin DB5. Aston Martin DB5 will be forever associated, of course, with James Bond. I mean, it always will be the Goldfinger film. And everyone's imagination, every kid's imagination, the real car, of course, doesn't have an ejector seat, but it's for the guy that thinks themselves probably to be um, a fighter pilot or an airline pilot or, or, a, or a great international spy or a playboy. I mean, it is the Playboy's Express. It's the sort of car where you could jump in, catch the uh, boat train from Dover to Calais, and speed through the night and arrive at a grand hotel somewhere on the Italian Riviera, stirred but not shaken and ready for that first Dom Perignon on the terrace. It is heart-stoppingly gorgeous. It is pretty enough to stop a speeding train. It has a fantastic six-cylinder twin overhead cam engine. It would, in you know, 1961-62, do 150 miles an hour, which made it great. But much more than that, it had this wonderful, tweedy, British elegance. Aston Martin was one of a number of small, proud English companies known for hand-built craftsmanship. James Bond made Aston Martin glamorous. Of course, Bond was too busy, so instead, we asked Britain's favorite aristocrat to put the car through its paces. He's better known for his Ferrari collection, but Lord Charlie Brockett has never been one to shy away from the camera. We did get a reputation for making cars that were wacky, different, but well built and well, you know, it's huge attention to detail. That's what people liked. Yes, they were hand built and very elegant, but you couldn't always count on them to actually work. Uh, this is what happens in electric, electric windows in old cars. Well, it's going up eventually. Okay, now the red light is on permanently. I have a feeling that we might have lost the fan belt. I didn't see anything on the road behind us. There's another thing, you see, when you switch the wiper off, does it center to, to its next cycle? Oh, no, it goes off precisely when you tell it to go off, which is in the middle of the windscreen. And, it, and stopping them down there becomes an art. 
No, it's not going to do it. You know why? Oops, it's just done something at me. Because, <laughs> that was wonderful. If you light up a cigarette, you might go bang and explode because the fumes are so great inside the cockpit. Um, always they had um, harsher suspension like there. Uh, you can feel it. You have to remember, these things don't have brakes. You do have to push quite hard to get uh, any reaction at all. But all of that makes you feel that it's more of an experience. It just requires more effort and concentration to keep the damn thing on the road. Of course, not everyone has a little bond in them. It's an old man's car. The greatest thing I'd ever achieved was being in the Bond movie. If it wasn't in the Bond movie, it probably wouldn't be remembered that highly. It's a relatively heavy car. It's a luxurious car, um, but it is the epitome of the grand touring car. It is absolutely, radically not a sports car. A sports car has a singleness of purpose. It is meant to drive. I mean, it should be ultimate driving enjoyment with no compromise. You don't need to bring along your golf clubs or your family. A GT car, a Gran Turismo car, absolutely gives a nod to those creature comforts on the road. It is definitely right up there in the top 10 coolest cars of all time just because of James Bond. But, you know, doesn't make it a sports car in my book. The DB5 is on our list because it represents the old spirit of craftsmanship that made English sports cars adored worldwide. It's stuck at number seven because some argue it's more a coupe than a sports car. And for that other reason, Britain's cars are famous. They break down. Inspired form and revolutionary function come together in the Mercedes Gullwing SL at number six. It's such a work of art. It really is, you know, it, it's stunning. It, it's better than any Picasso. The lines of the Gullwing are pretty much perfect. The thing the car has, it's wonderfully taut shape and yet has rather voluptuous curves, but they're not the voluptuous curves that, um, like the Chevy Corvette, which are a bit over the top and brazen and showy. These are curves kept in check and you know that the car's been designed to be super aerodynamic and yet it's hugely glamorous at the same time. Ava Gardner had one, Clark Gable drove one. Um, some favour the convertibles, but for me, the Gullwing with those doors is just so cool. It is the pick of the bunch. To arrive in a car and then the doors go up on little gas struts was really quite special. You want to make a stir? In those days, you arrive in a Gullwing, you've made it. Certainly, the Gullwing is a milestone car, aesthetically, technologically. I mean, it stunned the world when it came out. Everybody just went, holy mackerel, look at the technology they've put in that thing. Its tubular space frame made the Gullwing extra rigid, crucial for control at high speeds. And at only 82 kilograms, the frame was as light as a feather. But those same tubes took up room where the bottom of the doors would go. So instead, they would hinge on the roof and lift up, as opposed to out. It was a practical piece of design, but wound up becoming the car's exotic signature. I mean, those doors were just unbelievable. It literally looked like a bird with the window, with the, the doors open. And when you pull them down, you're in this cocoon. No issue. Getting out is more difficult because you actually got to get your bottom on the ledge back up from the seat and swing out. But um, you see, Mercedes Germans are so clever. I just think of all these things because what happens if the woman is driving wearing a skirt? There's a, there's a bar under the steering wheel, and you pull it out, and the steering wheel goes up like that. So now you can raise yourself, flip your legs over. See, the Germans think of everything. Damn them. Yet another innovation. This was the first production car in the world to use fuel injection. It was one of the most important high-tech advancements in the history of sports cars, and yet the concept of fuel injection is deceptively simple. With a carburetor, you've got pressure from the fuel tank via a pump, but it's low pressure. And when you put your foot on the accelerator, the fuel falls into the manifold like that, mixes with the air, explosive mix, and the car accelerates. That was fine for normal cars, but again, the Gullwing wanted to use race technology. With fuel injection, it's different. 
because the fuel is actually propelled at high pressure into each cylinder, mixed with the air, and it's the exact amount of fuel. So it's efficient. It is the most combustible fuel-air mix, so that you get the biggest explosion and therefore the greatest amount of acceleration and no wastage. It's an engineering-driven car, not a styling-driven car, and the styling comes after the engineering, and it's wrapping up the engineering. It's not that the styling's there not to sell, and the cars, of course, they didn't need to sell many of these cars. They're a rarity, and they have a single purpose, driving hard and fast. While renowned the world over for its glamorous looks and technical achievements, it wasn't always the easiest car to drive. Driving it, it's a truck. You know, it's a big, heavy thing. The brakes, you got to push your, you know, the pedal through the floor to get it to stop. And the uh, exhaust ran right underneath the car, so the floorboard get, gets really, really hot. It'll melt your tennis shoes. And it had its big swing axle in the back, so when you really got hauling butt, you could get it squirrely very easily. So it was sort of like riding the bull. It was unpredictable on the corner, and the suspension wasn't actually very good, which is a pity because the rest of it was brilliant. It's not the nicest engine note. It's not the nicest looking. It's not the nicest interior. But as an overall package, it is one of the greatest. Halfway through our countdown, we've had cars that epitomize style, speed, and groundbreaking technology. Still ahead, the machine that saved the sports car business as we search for the greatest ever sports car. So far in our top 10 greatest ever sports cars, we've had the most outrageous, most glamorous and coolest cars of all time. What could top that? How about a car that literally brings the Formula One experience right to your front door? It's pretty hard to beat a car that can do everything. If you collect Ferraris, you have to have one of these. Ferrari is the ultimate sports car company, and it's the ultimate Ferrari at the minute, today. I think I would probably spend a lot of time in the garage just sitting out there just going, yeah. To get to number five on this list, you need something really special. How about this? Everything Ferrari has ever learned about racing cars on a track has been applied to their latest creation for the road, the Enzo, named after Enzo Ferrari himself. They are the quickest at putting a track race technology into the road car. So last year's race technology will literally be in next year's road car. No company has a greater singleness of purpose than Ferrari. All of their cars are sports cars. That's all they are. There are two seats and a giant engine. They are only meant to do one thing, and that's drive hard and drive fast. Under the hood, a six-liter V12 capable of 660 horsepower, double the Stingray. A top speed of 220 miles per hour is too scary for most drivers to contemplate. Nought to 60 in one, two, 3.6 seconds. For a street car, it's about as close as you can come to a Formula One. Shifting gears with a flick of the fingers, just like in F1, the Enzo only needs 150 milliseconds between shifts to respond. Regular cast iron brakes would melt stopping from high speeds, but the Enzo's carbon ceramic brakes can handle the high temperatures. That's because carbon ceramics don't conduct heat like metal does. 60 to zero in 106 feet. When you buy a Ferrari, you're buying the badge. You know, the prancing horse is, is a great symbol. Um, you're buying the heritage. You're, you're buying the Italian flavor. You know, you're buying India lifestyle in a way. But buying a Ferrari is, of course, much easier said than done. Money is not the object. It's whether you're part of this exclusive club, whether you're fit to drive an Enzo. That's great. And in terms of marketing, fantastic. A lot of it has been a brand building exercise. To now they can comfortably uh, demand an, an, an enormous price premium, and they still have people lined up for them. One person who knows okay. firsthand about buying one of these rare supercars is Ray Moranges. They want the people that are true enthusiasts to have it. They, they just don't want somebody who can come up to the dealer and write a check. 
I wanted the car and I was prepared to do just about anything for it. I had to become part of the, the Ferrari family. I had to prepare a resume of all the cars that I had owned. I had to get letters of recommendation. It was like trying to get accepted into Harvard. At first I was rejected and uh, I persisted and through uh, cajoling and politicking and uh, buying lots of lunches and going in and shaking a lot of hands, I was able to um, get on the list. I walked in and when I saw the car, uh, I just couldn't believe it, that a guy like me could get a car like that. By the way, the car Ray bought cost roughly £300,000. Most of that money goes to F1-style technology, and because of that, the car's looks, at least in some eyes, have suffered. We know in Formula One, aerodynamics don't necessarily make for beautiful shapes. So we've got an automobile in terms of the Enzo that is an incredibly high-performance automobile, uh, brilliantly designed, beautifully engineered, but built around a body that demands raw physics in terms of aerodynamics. So we don't have a particularly, in my opinion, pretty automobile. The Enzo Ferrari is actually very blousy and very vulgar. It looks like a big sort of hairdryer on wheels, and I think it's a great shame in a way, because Ferraris at their best are these lithe, smooth, neat, rather neat machines. Um, this thing is clearly meant to be a, a racing car for the road, a modern racing car for the road, and because of that, it's too wide, too big altogether, and just blatantly vulgar, and you feel like an absolute idiot driving one. Everything on these cars, chassis, suspension, brakes, motor, all of it derived from Formula One. That's what makes it special. But even if you liked its looks and were able to get your hands on one, where would you drive it? The greatest ever asked the state police to shut down part of the interstate just so he could film the Enzo stretching its legs. not one to miss an opportunity, Ray takes full advantage, pushing his Ferrari to nearly triple the speed limit. But where are you going to do that? Here in America, we're in the wrong place to own one. If you're pushing it on, you'll be over 100 miles an hour too often, and eventually someone will pull out, a dog will pull out, something will happen, and you'll slice it in half on a lamppost. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Rarely out of first on the track, this Ferrari will have to settle for fifth on our list. 1960s England. The nation is finally breaking out of its post-war austerity. A new generation of hipsters, mods and beatniks are turning heads all over London. At the centre of that swinging scene is a positively groovy sports car, unlike anything that has come before. The E-Type Jaguar. Here is a car that signalled, hey, Britain was at the centre of the hip-hop happening 60s, um, and the E-Type was part of that. The E-Type, to me, it is the most beautiful car in the world. No other car before or since has been so beautifully, beautifully designed. When we buy these cars now, when we wax lyrical over them, when we spend all the money we haven't got rebuilding them, it's because we're trying to recapture that seminal moment of March 1961, when this car changed the way the world thought about sports cars. It was just the most dramatic thing anybody had ever seen. When the E-Type hit the world, it just was a collective gasp. I mean, this car was pure sex. We like to say that if birth control pills hadn't been invented, when the E-Type came out, they would have needed to invent them very quickly. The most phallic of all cars ever produced, the E-Type. It was, you know, it was a what was they say, a horizontal expression of man's intention or something. The E-Type was one of the first production cars to do 150 miles per hour. It was a direct descendant of a long line of racing jacks that had dominated circuits in the 1950s. The reason why it was special was not only its design and its looks, it had a the classic improved engine that was originally in the D-Type, that was a famous racing car but also it was ridiculously cheap. And this was the democratization of the racing car. Anybody could buy one of these cars. Doesn't mean you didn't have any driving skill. You could just go in, pay your Jaguar dealer 2,000 pounds, and you were driving around lit by your own personal spotlight. Everywhere you went, there was a shaft of gold because you had an E-Type. 
The E-Type was famous for its unique beauty. Unfortunately, it also had a reputation for falling apart. In many ways, the E-Type was style over content. Rust proofing was not a very advanced science back in those days, and they just literally rust from the inside out. Go to start your car after a week, turn the ignition, the fuel pump wouldn't go tick, 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 so you take a small hammer and just tap the fuel pump and it should have startled it into life. A Jaguar always had a lot of mechanical problems, and back in those days, uh, Lucas Electricals were um, the butt of many jokes, like why do the British drink warm beer? Answer, because they have Lucas refrigerators. It was a good idea to be really close friends with your mechanic, uh, because you were gonna see them a lot. Yeah, so you might as well put them on the Christmas card list. It overheated. The, uh, there wasn't enough room for your feet. The brakes were heart-stoppingly bad. The headlights, uh, you couldn't see at night. But that's what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned, with a sports car. You couldn't make this car now because of all the product liability, all the lawyers, all the solicitors. They just wouldn't, wouldn't allow you to. Too fast, too dramatic, too dangerous, too wonderful. So we've overtaken everything on the road. We've touched 105 miles an hour. This is a 44-year-old car, and it feels great. It's fantastic. It's still as captivating, still as exciting, still as sexy as it was in 1961. Now do you understand? The E-Type makes our list because it's quite possibly the best-looking car ever made. But the fact that it was moody and couldn't always be counted on to show up confines this supermodel to number four. I think this is the best car ever built, certainly the best car of the 20th century. At number three, record-setting McLaren F1. The McLaren F1 is really the field of dreams supercar. It makes it into the bronze medal spots because this is the fastest road car in the world. A car that cost a million dollars. <laughs> the engine is actually encased in gold for heat protection. Basically, the premise behind it is build it and they will buy it. This was a car where basically money was no object. And they just made the car that they thought would be perfect. And what they came up with was a car that will still, at the high end, outperform a Formula One car. The car is so much better than you are. You know, it's a bit like having sex with an aerobics instructor. You're never going to wear her out. Do the best you can. And she's going, OK, you done? Are we through now? <sighs> yeah. OK, great. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's how good it is. Compared to normal cars, the F1 is as light as a feather. That's because it's made with an all-carbon composite body. Combine that with a 627 horsepower engine, and you can go from 0 to 60 in just over 3.2 seconds. Just like the Enzo, this really is a race car, very thinly disguised for the street. Oh, it's wonderful to drive. This is one of the few cars where, oh my god, I'm going 175. Sorry, sorry. Excuse me. I mean, it's, it's literally that fast. It is the fastest car in the world. To this day, there's not a Ferrari or a Porsche that can beat it in top speed. A beautiful technical tour de force. And it occupies a very, very special place. It's Mount Olympus as far as cars go. I don't believe any manufacturer will have the money, the wherewithal, or the, the justification to ever do that again. But we'll see but I don't think so. The research and development is too huge. It can only really be done by uh, a current Formula One uh, or Indy car producer. If there is ever artistry in mechanical engineering and mechanical things, this is it. I mean, there's no silly wing on it. It doesn't look outrageous. It just looks sensual. It isn't like a Countach where it's 12-year-old boys are salivating over it. I mean, it's a mature expression of, of an engineering design and concept. Still can't find the flaw? Well, some of our contributors have. Yes, extremely interesting, but considering the price that's asked, it is accessible to so few people. To me, it's, it's an interesting car, but it's an irrelevant one. It's not a beautiful looking machine. It's a really functional little machine, and it will always be remembered, I think, as an engineering classic rather than a design classic. Why three seats? 
you know, sitting in the middle. Yeah, it's Formula One and all that, but I, it's, I don't want to sit in the middle of a road car. I want to, you know, I want to sit on one side and I want to have the hottest chick I can have sitting on the net in the seat beside me. I don't want one there and one there because the two of them are going to squabble and distract me. And um, insurance? I don't know. Can you get insurance in cars like that? I shouldn't think so. Um, apart from anything else, it was very difficult to get an order. So, like Ferrari, they had to approve you, not you bring them up and say, can I have one? So is it attainable? No. You have to leave it high up on the list. It is a spectacular achievement. And just because people can't get one doesn't make it, you know, any less important. The day I got this car, I drove it home. I drove up my street. I saw another one two doors down. <laughs> I said, hey, wait a minute. So I, I didn't even know the guy. I just knocked on the door. I said, is that your McLaren? He goes, yeah. I, said, I got one, too. And he was visiting this, this woman who lived in the house. And he just, just made me laugh. I said, well, there's only 64 of these in the world. Wow, this is pretty cool. Ah. Next on our list, the sports car that literally saved the sports car business. Some of the sexiest names on the street, like Mercedes and BMW, owe a huge debt to the modest little Mazda Miata, the biggest selling two-seat convertible of all time. I think the Miata is the most influential sports car uh, of its time. It actually brought back the idea of having a personal sports car. When we were lost, we had nothing. So cars today, like BMW Z4, Mercedes SLK, all owe their existence to the success of the Mazda Miata. The Miata did for the sports car movement what uh, the British sports cars did in the 50s and early 60s, in that it repopularized the concept of a two-door, two-passenger roadster. There is an example of a sports car that's not a high-performance car out of the box, but it's absolutely perfect. You are down to the ground. It's still under 2,500 pounds. Um, the power-to-weight ratio is perfect. The balance is perfect. It's an absolute joy to drive. Because it was so light and evenly balanced front to back, the Miata handled superbly. It wasn't expensive. Um, it handled brilliantly was cheap to run, and it performed well. And lastly, and most irritatingly, Japanese again, it was reliable. When they tested prototypes, they went out over to Santa Barbara, and they were literally being pursued by joggers, waving checkbooks and things like this. You know, what is this car? We want to buy it. You know, this is, this is great. Not exactly the most macho of sports car, the Miata is known more for its social clubs than setting speed records. It takes a sluggish seven plus seconds to get from naught to 60. I normally use it for going to the grocery store and back, so I don't usually go over 40 miles an hour. I know every woman has a dream of being able to get on a racetrack and go fast and beat the guys and prove that it's not just a, a, a man's sport, it can also be a woman's sport too. Greatest ever set up a day at the track with a former race car driver to see if Judy could learn to transform her mild-mannered roadster into a genuine racer. Okay, we're starting now. First, Judy's instructor puts her Miata through its paces, or at least gets it going over 40. gives people a watered down version of of owning a sports car you know for for a limited budget and it drives better than many much bigger much more powerful much more showy sports cars but it doesn't have oomph. it's a chick car it's a girl car you know i you know i see a guy driving that down the highway and i just feel bad for him <laughs> <laughs> would i be seeing you one good lord no my friends never speak to me again. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so it's not a high-performance Ferrari, but these cars can touch 130 miles an hour. Of course, the driver has to be willing. Alas, a total transformation was not to be. On this day, the Miata stereotype of being essentially a girl's car held true. Oh, well, that was fun. <laughs> Still, in typical Miata fashion, they had fun. I can't believe I did that. 
faster, faster, faster. A number of people think that the Miata is a girl's car because it only has a little four-cylinder engine. But I think that's missing the point. A great sports car is not just about the numbers. It's about how it makes you feel when it's, you're driving it along. And it is a man's sports car, not just a woman's car. No, I wouldn't call it a girly car, no. It, I think it's also, I, I would say it's a, it's a unisex car. It's a different feeling, no less a sports car, but just a different, it is a lightness of being. Unbelievable. It was so much fun. I just think the Miata has everything in a car. It just, it can do everything you ask it to do. You're kidding, right? <laughs> We've counted down nine amazing automobiles in our top 10 search to find the greatest ever sports car. When we come back, we'll find out which one tops them all. All the cars in our list can boast amazing pedigrees. They represent the very best in engineering and design. But there is one that always seems to silence the critics. It's been hailed as an engineering marvel, a legendary racer, and at the same time, a 24-7 supercar for the masses. At number one, the Porsche 911. I think the greatest sports car of all time probably would be the 911, really, because of its longevity. This car has been around for 40 years in basically the same soulful package. The Porsche 911 is probably the most worthy sports car to put at the top of the list, the greatest sports car of all time. It's a success story in America, it's a success story in Europe, Japan. You know, it has gone around the world and been appreciated in every company. I guess this is where it all started. I guess the, uh, the 911 came out, first production year is 19, what, 64. And this car here uh, is a 69 two-liter short wheelbase. 40 years ago, Steve McQueen made this car famous in the movie Le Mans. Today, his son Chad takes us on the car for a little drive down memory lane. This car was a car that my dad used in Le Mans in early 1970. They, it came out, uh, and this was actually the, the car that he drove up to the church and, and did all that. And it's all, it's all original. It's got, I just turned 47,000 original miles on the car. To create room for two small back seats, the motor was placed over the rear axle. It was completely revolutionary, but it led to a unique problem for the 911. It was known to suffer from something called oversteer. The earlier ones were a pig. I didn't like them at all, because again, you lose your concentration, whatever, get something wrong, hit a bit of damp bit round the corner, God forbid a bit of oil, and you are definitely going the wrong way round the corner. It was a car that was always slightly fundamentally flawed. It never really steered or went around corners as well as it should have done in the early days. The thing about the Porsche, they're tricky to drive fast, uh, especially the vintage ones, the older ones. Uh, they're race cars. I mean, you've got a massive weight in the rear. Say you're, you're going into a right-hand corner. You turn the car in, it's a pendulum effect. You go into a corner and the car wants to rotate. It's the same thing as if, uh, say, you throw a hammer. This is what I'm trying to explain. The head of the hammer is going to always want to hit the ground first because it's the heaviest. So the car does have a natural tendency to want to oversteer. I just love the sound of this motor. Puts a smile on my face. Since the early days, Porsche has worked extensively on controlling the car's tendency to slide. Over the years, the, the wheelbase has extended. Um, of course, wider rims, tire setup. They would push the motor a little further in front of the axle, get a better balance. All they've done is taken that essence of the car with the, you know, more than 50% of the weight in the back, and it's beautiful, just organic shape and made it a little better and a little better. And sometimes they tweak it a little too far. The next year, they come back a little, back a little. It's just a great car. The 911 was also the first production car to have a turbocharged engine. Recycled air from the exhaust is forced back into the cylinders under pressure, where it mixes with the fuel to create a hotter, more explosive reaction. To understand turbocharging, think of what happens to a fire when a big wind comes along. 
Or if you happen to be near a garage, how about a simple air hose and a gently smoldering cigar? What we're about to do here is basically a real simple version of uh, how a turbocharger works. What we have here is a fuel, and then we have our compressed air. So when you step on the accelerator, say this is your recycled gases, compressed, here's your fuel, and... Super hot. That's a turbo. Throughout its history, the 911 has been a peerless innovator. At the same time, the car never lost its original spirit. It's just a natural evolution, you know? That car became successful because it deserved its success. It really did. You just touch it and it feels quality. You close the door, it feels quality. You close the boot, it's quality. The seats are quality. The switches are quality. You know, they're very simple inside. And over 40 years, the idea of this strange little car, which in its classic days had a rear engine and a very strange rear engine too, was made to behave perfectly. And so we could all watch as this car developed and got better and better over the years. You don't lose a lineage from this car to this one. 